I'm Telly Mahoney, and welcome back to The Good Room. Today, we're thinking what's possible for the future of the patient room with Joan Albert, a principal and regional health care director at PAGE, and Zach Hilliard, a technology principal at SSR. PAGE and SSR collaborated on the Houston Methodist Cypress Hospital, which is a digitally advanced hospital that improves communications between physicians, staff, patients, and their families. So before we jump into the conversation, Zach, could you please explain what we mean when we say a smart hospital? It's a great question because that definition isn't ubiquitous. It's different depending upon the organization, the institution, the resources that you have available and that who you serve. So smart in my mind means that it's going to do a service, a benefit through some form of either technology or new innovative approach. So a smart patient room, there's services that don't have to be physically in that space that could benefit that space and vice versa. For the patient, there's technology, could be medical equipment, could be a whole host of things that give them more empowerment through user control. Just like at your home, when you wanna be able to talk to your favorite voice assistant and turn things on and off, those same features we're trying to bring into that built environment for healthcare. It's a big delighter. That's the thing is you want to leave high satisfaction with the customers. And in healthcare, there's many, many customers. So, Just as far as our latest experience with it, the CEO sort of boiled it down to making lives better, both for the staff and for the patients, and really basing it around safety and patient satisfaction was the core driver for all of this. And of course, anybody's experience with the hospital is going to start with that essential arrival experience. How might the arrival experience be changing with the new technology that we're thinking and how that's impacting the built environment there? So for me, it really starts when you turn into the campus from the road and creating that infrastructure to allow wayfinding on your personal device is to me, transformative, because that's a great stressor for people as they're getting to a hospital. It's very complex and usually very labyrinthian. And so being able to guide someone on their personal device to the best parking space that's closest to where they're going, and then from the parking space, guide them to actually where their exam is being had or to the OR waiting area or the check-in area if they have to stop in there. But to me, that's the ease of that is really going to bring the stress level down from the very beginning. Depending upon when you start that journey, and this is what we've had a lot of fun working together, is almost the couch to couch if it's like an ambulatory experience. When you leave your home, we're thinking about you and we're, we're going to return you there safely, but with quality care. So that journey, that patient arrival sequence is pretty lengthy and has multiple things along the way. Specifically, once you get to a hospital, though, I think it's giving you the navigational autonomy as a patient. So depending upon what era you come from, sometimes you want to talk to people. Sometimes you just you're very busy. You want to stay focused and and use the technology. So when you arrive in those spaces, is there intuitive landmarks or things that are going to engage with you? Like kiosk tablets, we still see those everywhere. How are we going to use software that's already native to a what we call a technology stack within the institution, meaning assets that they already have? How can we express those in our design so that the arrival sequence is really more fluid? It could be a simple a couple of clicks. A good analogy of this is like your Uber and Lyft experience. So when you think of those holistic experiences, that's kind of that patient arrival piece. How are we going to greet each other, have safety and security in mind? but then get on our our way in a a copacetic space. So we're putting those components and features into the healthcare design of the future. One of the unseen elements of that is the space that's returned to the hospital for better use. I went back last night and compared our last hospital to the one that we're building currently, and we had eight pretty large office spaces for patient access services. That's where you check in in lieu of the kiosk. And for the new hospital, we're doing just a one or two that are flex spaces. And so you really are giving back that space for better use, for patient satisfaction, for clinical clinical spaces. And the other thing that I think we're going to hear throughout this talk is redundancy. Having that human available to interact, even if you are doing everything on your handheld device or your kiosk, I think that's really important throughout. And we keep hearing that coming back as we're continuing to develop. 
Moving to the patient room, what are some elements that you might incorporate into that that can improve the overall quality of care for patients? For me, it's about giving the patient control and autonomy, as Zach said, and really customizing it to the patient as well. So you're showing up to your room and it's really like a hotel experience. Your name is up on the screen, you know, hello, John Smith, welcome. You're here today, you know, to have such and such procedure. To me, that's a really wonderful experience. It goes further in allowing the patient to really control everything, the lighting, the air, the shade, being able to call for help or just call for a glass of water. That control when you're in a, an experience as a patient that's extremely stressful, scary, and you feel completely out of control in a lot of ways, that little bit of control can make a big difference. Absolutely. And then expanding upon that, there's features like I talked a little earlier about services and clinical skills that maybe are outside that space that are going to serve that space. So when you think of telehealth and the example that we're pretty familiar with these days, the downturn of the pandemic, everybody needed that additional care, but couldn't go anywhere. So there was this new barrier. Those really changed kind of the landscape and the lens of how we look at these spaces and almost amplified them even more. Nurses and clinicians are really in short supply. Like they're not as ample as you may think. So using the best of their top of license skills to serve a bigger population is kind of a challenge. And natively in the design, the terminology really is ambient intelligence. How can you put ambient intelligence in, in virtual nursing as components of a room? Where would you put those mediums, the cameras themselves? Because it's really about having that line of sight, the eye to eye contact, but then what's happening in that environment. And so they're looking at a whole lot of factors and they're using that to give you better care. And with that ambient intelligence, how is that helping patient safety? So thinking of seeing if they're falling or being able to anticipate I'm trying to make it, it correlate to like, you know how in your backyard you have a motion sensor and there's something that moves. And then all of a sudden, maybe now with the ring and Google Nest and all that, you see what happened, right? Because there was a moment that happened. Well, that same principle kind of applies here with ambient intelligence so that if, you, if we don't want you to get out of bed without assistance, then it's really hard to intervene before you harm yourself. So it's about really serving an, a different quality metric of not allowing the patient to harm themselves or get in a situation that they just can't control. So without putting a million sensors in spaces, we're using a camera as a sensor. And in doing that, you can set this geo perimeter so that when you cross a specific space in that line of sight, it can alert and alarm the right people at the right time to intervene. So let's say that there's a distance limitation to you getting to that space. And if you're serving as a, as a caregiver, you can now pop up on the screen or intervene and, sit and alarm them in a way that kind of protects them from hurting themselves. They don't get out of bed because it says, hey, stay in bed. We're on our way. We know that you need a restroom break. We'll be right there. But now you're there at their bedside, even though you're physically not in that space. And I think that's super, super cool. That's even today becoming more expanded with sensors that are in the bed themselves. You hear about smart beds. So now we get to bring those things in there and really have better safety measures for the patient. Yeah. And so for me as an architect, when I first heard we're going to have several cameras staring at the patient, it made me a little concerned. So that obviously yeah. became a huge focus of how we maintained the hospitality feel that we've always wanted to bring to the patient room but make it flexible enough that knowing that the technology was going to change, that we could accommodate that within the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So we ended up creating a really nice shelf that would accommodate. But I think in the future, we look to hopefully making a lot of this disappear as much as possible. And so I think that's, we're just obviously in the, in the beginning steps of this. And it's so important for patient safety and satisfaction. But as we move, I think we're going to see some really incredible things happen. We're kind of creating built environments that produce magic acts because yeah. essentially it's just like going to a magician in Vegas. You don't really see what's happening, but you know that it's been a well thought out a sequence of events. And so Joan's right. There's a lot of different opinions about that because not many people want to have a camera observing them all the time. So a lot of it's the cultural changes that the organization has to adopt 
in communicating marketing, communicating the education for the staff. Why are we doing this and how does it benefit you? I think that was an interesting one, just even on the design side that we had to consider before even scaring everyone with like, these new features going. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then and then arming the staff to be able to educate the patient and getting them comfortable because you walk into a room with cameras pointing at you. That's really disconcerting. But when you learn that it's going to be there for your safety and fall rates have gone down and it's incredible how early they can see that the body is making just the wrong movement as they're either trying to get out of bed or rearranging their positions and an alert goes off and staff can get in there in time. It's it's pretty incredible to see that live in action. And I think that moves seamlessly into our conversation of the staff and clinicians. And there is a shortage of staff in these environments. And nurse burnout is something that a lot of us were hearing often. How is this technology also helping improve those issues going on in the hospital system and improving the experience for the staff that are there? You can start to have your specialists show up on the screen for telehealth visits. And so you can get nationwide specialists in your room giving your information. To me, that's a huge benefit. There short supply of doctors and being able to get that immediate interaction, I think, is really a great asset for that. Yeah. The, the telehealth component, that's really key, is you have kind of a full array of assets that you can bring now into that space to assist. And you don't have to burden it with a physical space of standing around the bedside. You can just bring them in intentionally and improve the whole care experience. The innovation is overcoming the geography constraints, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. really cool. I, I think you're you're right on that one, Joan. Yeah, so I think the ultimate goal, obviously, is to allow the staff to focus on patient side, bedside. That's been the goal. And so the virtual nursing is taking a lot of the weight off the staff's shoulders by doing the registration, the checkout. A lot of the paperwork is being done by virtual nursing, and, and that allows the nurses to actually be by the bedside more. To me, that's a huge benefit. Yeah, earlier you had talked about the quality and safety measures, too. And so when you think about just this step away from what we're doing and just really look and observe it and recognize the value, it's you're going to have a standardized process through virtual nursing that's controlled. So the more you can control an environment or an experience, the more quality and safety you're going to get. So by having virtual nursing do that handoff, that is a huge benefit to those bedside nurses because anybody that's been in a very busy, hectic hospital med surge floor there's a lot of distractions. If we can do any small task to take some of those remedial or um, administrative components and virtualize them, it only improves the well being of the bedside staff. I think ultimately, too, and you might know more about this, Zach, but the intent is that the staff is able to do a checkup or the, the physicians will do a checkup and everything will be taken down by the voice control. So you might want to go more into that so that oh, it's dictated. dictated. Yeah, yeah. yeah, basically. So yeah, that takes using, a lot of weight off their shoulders. Yeah. I mean, how cool the technology is today, especially, I mean. If you haven't heard about this new thing called chat GPT, it's like the buzz of the world, but not say that that's in healthcare, but everybody's familiar with that because it's, it's headlines. Well, really, if you get to the brass tacks of like why it's so significant, especially with voice services, is that you can just have conversations now and that administrative burden of note taking, it's relaxed quite a bit. Doesn't mean that we hand it off completely to AI. And I, I want to edify that just for the audience that there is concern there for sure. And those are that's part of our design effort as a holistic team is to crosswalk those things. But the reality is that it's still up to the clinician or care provider to approve or edit those notes. But you can capture so much just through the microphones that are in the room. And there are a lot of microphones in a patient room even today. I mean, the nurse call button alone, when you hit that button, there's microphones on the head rails of the bed. There's microphones in the pillow speaker itself. So it's not anything that we're adding new today. We're just amplifying them because the technology has gotten to the point where those burdens are now digitized and auditable so that you're saving dictation time. What's the one thing if you sit with any doctor that they hate is 
the note taking after they just had that same experience. It's almost asking them to do it twice. So the improvements there, I mean, there's still a ways to go, but they've gotten really, really good. And I think that's an improvement of quality because now with AI, you can listen for prompted keywords. So you can already dictate that entire after visit summary or clinician notes in a very meaningful way. And it's more of a, an approval status than a please write me everything you just said. Right. That'll, that'll lead to a lot of physician satisfaction, staff satisfaction too. The thing that I think about with digitalizing is energy and just how much energy it must go into to keep this hospital running. So how do you think about this in terms of sustainability and energy efficiency? The way I'd start that conversation just to find commonality would be, do you have an occupancy sensor in your home? And why do you do that? Well, you don't want to leave the lights on. And that's an energy savings, right? So if, if there's no presence in a room, that's essentially a benefit of saving energy. A lot of those same principles go here. So sustainability to me, I mean, that's that's a deep one. Like I'm not a, a sustainability expert. I have a lot of, I'm fortunate to have a lot of partners in, in my firm that are. But when you think about lead and well, a lot of those have technology properties that we're thinking about in the design to meet those metrics to to return energy savings to the building as a whole for for lighting, for water use, but in even the resources themselves. Like how do I get more efficiency out of the dietary services department that they're not having to waste so much time to transport food? Maybe I do that through like an what they call an AMR, autonomous mobile robot or AGV. You know, using technology to do that distribution Designers need to know those things because guess what? They go over the different types of flooring. They have to go vertical in an elevator. Like there's a whole chain of events that is super, it's almost a Rubik's cube. It's just super cool, but it's like a million ways to turn it. And you have to think about those factors. So, Yeah. And on our last project, we were, we were going through all of the, the wants and, and whittling it down to what they could manage at the time. But we ended up putting a lot of infrastructure and making sure that there was the ability to connect to the elevators for robots in the future. So we did a lot of setup and infrastructure to prep them um, yeah. without necessarily doing it for day one. So for me, some of the things we had to deal with as far as flexibility goes, we, for the robots, we did end up having to steal a little bit of space for um, robot charging. So that sort of area needs to be available in the future for mm. when they want to accommodate for that. And we also have a shell space for a robot pizza maker, which I think is pretty awesome, but that they didn't implement that day one, but we needed to leave the space flexible enough to accommodate it in the dining area if they wanted to pull the trigger on that. Yeah, you don't want to go back in and say, we need to expand the corridor by four feet. Oh. <laughs> That's not a good thing, guys. <laughs> this exactly. structure is kind of built, right? So that's a tough one. Replace the elevator controls. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. tough yeah. So we, on that. We, we did think widely about leaving a path forward so that they could grow into the technology when they need it in order to augment services and get those sustainable innovations in place. And for me, the really important thing there is to be able to educate the leadership of the hospital. And Zach, that's where Zach is really great about bringing in the menu of possible innovation options, knowing that they're not going to implement all of them, but just making sure that they are aware of what is and may be available in the future. And then how do you set yourself up to allow that to be implemented long, long term, potentially? Something I'm also thinking about here is the need for resilient measures. And I'm thinking in terms of a hurricane or some other natural disaster that might cause a power outage and how the technology appears clearly very reliant on that. How do you think about creating resilient measures? We, we talk about earmarking a station for downtime in downtime printer, downtime PC. And usually those are backed up with a standalone UPS, uninterruptible power supply, so that essentially operations can happen. There's a different playbook that you have to do per floor to operate the space when technology fails. And you know what? It will. I mean, it was like national news, AT&T went down. That's horrible. 
you saw the ripple effect of even that, I think, where people were calling just to make sure that they could reach local utility services for emergency services, inundating 911. Well, part of that is in the design process itself. It's one thing to put that external layer of like, you know, euphoric experiences at the forefront. And that's really the goal. That's where you want to probably stay 95 to 97 percent of the time, maybe 99 percent of the time. But there is that contingent that we have to plan for of space by space going through and saying, if this technology was to be offline or just out of service or essentially had a fail point, what would happen? What would we do? How would we operate? Would we be able to, to meet or exceed the minimum standard of care? And the answer is always yes, because that's the bottom bar. We're going to exceed that. So we're thinking about helping them with building the playbook. That's what we're doing on, right now on another job is we're doing an operationalizing effort to build a playbook. Technology first, but if not technology, then what? Yeah. It's obviously a huge concern, especially in a place like Houston's. And then the other thing I kind of wanted to hear Zach's take on, looking at the future 50, 100 years. So all the technology that we're hearing about seems like the patient room that we were just talking about may just move into a home or it may become this other whole total model with, with all the abilities to monitor. Do you see, what do you see as the far future of a patient room? Yeah, I mean, depending upon how far in the future, because there's the near now and far and we're going really far. I, I agree with that, that there's going to be a lot of these components where you can almost pick up a lot of the properties of a smart room and give it to an at-home model. But to me, what changes for us and the people that we engage with that are delivering care is that there are going to be shifts in their department. So what I mean by that is you go to Apple. Okay, what? why do you go to Apple Store? Because they can speak to your use cases of what's broken or you need for your technology. They also are going to be able to prescribe the watch, the tablet, the Vision Pro, all of the things. And again, that's if you're in the Apple ecosystem. Same concept is you're going to have this almost like tech expert, tech expert component that is really vital to delivering that handoff to care at home. And then they're going to really stitch that back to the virtual nursing. Virtual nursing, I think, is going to become a bigger department looking more like a like you know, pictures of mission control in Houston. Like it's something like that that's really looking holistically at like how do we deliver care so that it doesn't become a detriment to people living their lives. And I think that's super cool, but it changes how we think about spaces because right. that department needs more square footage. It, it needs a bigger budget, but it's serving a bigger populational need. So the whole social determinants of health is big drivers right now in that space. And I think the one thing that really hit home for me, even as early as this year, was uh, I, was, I spent a week at the digital health uh, conference and at CES, which is Consumer Electronics Show. But they talked about the quintu quintuple aim. And that last component was health equity. And so when you think about health equity on scale, what is health equity? Well, it's access to technology and knowing the literacy to use technology for the betterment of health. That's exactly what we're talking about is scaling it outward. Going off of this idea that you might not need to go to the hospital and some of these things might be able to happen at home. Joan, how does that then make you think about your role in crafting the built environment? And is this also something that you may have thought of at Pages Health Forward Symposium, where I understand there was a charrette that encouraged people to think what's possible for the future of healthcare? Yeah, so I think it's a really interesting question because it it sort of it takes us out of the equation for potentially a lot of the patient rooms. I think the critical patients will still be going to the hospital for care and for operations, et cetera. But at, how do we translate our profession into the home environment? We we actually did a charrette after our symposium and we looked at a model that kind of plugged into the house so that it was a sort of an ICU room that plugged into the house that it would allow back and forth from the home unit. So to me, that's where it might go. Kind of fascinating line of thought. Yeah, it's almost using the, the modular components of like, how could you take out or bite out some benefit of a hospital and essentially put it out in the population. Yeah. So it really challenges like how you think about it. I think the hospital and the organizations are becoming more of an educational hub because of these lifestyle changes. Like if my hospital will probably be the avenue that teaches me new ways to live better so I don't have to go to the hospital. 
well, guess what? I'm going to continue going to that hospital because of that. It's a branding strategy too. That's the future forward is like, we're going to meet the people in this, in the communities that they live and serve so that they don't have to come here. But if they do need to come here for some orthopedic procedure or cancer treatment or whatever that is, that this is the place they trust because now we have that trust built with that patient. I love that you're leading with wellness though. But the one, the other thing that I wanted to tell about myself. So one of the reasons I got into healthcare architecture centered around the patient room. I was my grandmother's caretaker. And so she broke her hip and went into the hospital and it was not the nicest hospital. It was a small town. And so I just didn't know what to do. I, I wanted to help her environment, of course, as an architect. So I went to the local store and I found this $5 lamp. It was this beautiful thing for $5 that dappled light. It showed dappled light on the wall. And so I plugged it into her room and it had a little, she could, she could control the switch from her bed and it made all the difference. It was absolutely incredible. And she turned it on and off and it gave her that little bit of control that is now we're giving patients on a much larger scale. But to me, it's very transformative to see that. I love that. That's a great story. I love that yeah. story. It's something I was thinking about also is the role of, and you've talked about it a little with the hospitality space, making us feel that way, is I guess the role of aesthetics in the patient room and making it look and feel beautiful. Is that is that a key component amongst all of the patient technology that needs to be there in the heart rate monitor and everything? How do you think about beauty in that space? Exactly. Huge component to us that's a paramount. And so that's why working with Zach and, and trying to figure out how we maintain those aesthetics that are both warm, the materiality, the wood and the colors, super important. I think the thing that we haven't really tapped into yet that I look forward to in the future, and I think technology might be able to help us is the ceiling plane. So in the hospital bed, you're looking up at the ceiling all the time, but we're also having to access everything up there. So we're having to use access panels or typical ceiling grid. To me, there's a really, there's a lot of potential there. You know, do we start to put this, some screens up there or do we use the circadian lighting to change that plane? I think that's something in the future that I would love to see transform. This is exciting. I wish we'd had like all day to talk about this. Some really cool stuff that even as recent as this year has gotten better is ambient reality. So what I mean by that is even in a very vibrant and bright space, if I had a way to project something on the floor or the ceiling from another device so that it's really just a blank canvas that you could use it for navigational purposes. Like if Tully walked into a space and it said, hey, Tully, go to the right, you're in exam four but it could be projected on a wall just because you were in that space. How cool would that be? It would That's so essentially, cool. essentially it's the augmented reality component that we've kind of all have different versions of how we've experienced it, but those have to be really well thought out in relationship to the environment and the journey. But I'm excited to, to see those technologies get better because the digital ceiling component that from a technologist point of view, we've talked about that because we're putting more technology in that ceiling space to support wireless and connected experiences. If you can now use the canvas better instead of just having ceiling finish, but actually have it look over here and then this tells you everything or is telling you a story at night, whatever that is. Exactly. Yes, so the stars cool. are up there at night. I mean, you could just, it's, yeah, the potential yeah. is endless. Yeah, there's a lot of great innovators that are, are working on that now. So I'm excited to see that. I love that. Okay. See that coming. Next project. Someplace. It's very exciting what both of you are doing. And I love to look at it and learn about it. So thank you. Thank you, Tolly. It was Absolutely. fun. Thank, thank you both. Appreciate the time. Take care.